Welcome to Turning Pages, a series of in-depth conversations with authors about their works. All right, well, his latest thriller is called When She Left. E.A. Amar joins me on the show to discuss it. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and uh, happy to be in your lineup of uh, authors who have appeared on, on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, so I, I'm I'm very curious. It's, it's my first question, honestly, is something I don't think I've asked a, a, an author before, but it was one that the, the title suggested and kind of got me thinking. You begin this book basically kind of in situ with uh, Melissa and Jake in a, in a diner, in a late night diner, having kind of like already made a decision, already run away from something. And I, I'm very curious about kind of like knowing where and when to kind of begin the action in a book like this oh yeah you know it's it's really hard for me to figure out usually a story like that opens with a line and that kind of leads to everything else because you know you want like a, a really I, I really love clever original first lines um that's not always the case you know can't every it, it's hard to, to kind to always stumble find that perfect line but the diner seemed like an ideal place. I'm not sure why. I really, I, I had a vision, I think, that I wanted to set a really fast-paced thriller. And to do that, I needed to start immediately. And my past thrillers had a little bit of preamble before the big moment. And I didn't want that. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a bad thing for those books. I, I think they opened the right way. But for this, I wanted immediacy. Right. Like this is, this is a chase book and ultimately like kind of they're already on the run. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that the other thing, you know, with that is it's, it's nice to, for me, I love, God, I love writing backstory. It's the best. And it's, <laughs> I love like, yeah, I, I just feel like it, it's so much fun and it's poison for a reader. <laughs> It's the kind of thing that we cut huge, huge chunks out of in the editing process. So this prevented me from that because if they're on the run, you're introducing them in in flash cuts. You know, one of my, you know, I, I love Steven Spielberg's family movies. You know, like Indiana Jones, and he he's a master. I, I think it's it maybe it's been remarked, but I I haven't come across it a lot. He introduces characters so much by action. You know, a sudden change in the face, a, a dubious expression, you know, a, a slight joke all of a sudden. And you really get a grounded sense of who, like, Indiana Jones is or, you know, what the stakes are. And I think it's a good model to follow. So the notion that you, you can learn about someone by how they react to something rather than, you know, them telling you? Yeah, exactly. Right. It's it's very much um, the kind of thing that we're taught to do, you know, you show don't tell and it's still hard to break you know i mean there's great writers i come across you know i read i read a lot of a lot of crime fiction writers and there's great ones out there and we all do it we all take a point in the plot where we're you know um putting information out there that could be better expressed somehow else but it's um yeah it, it this, this kind of this is a, a bit of a trick to get through that to have uh to have something that's compelling and also informative you mentioned you know that you think backstory is the best like like you just enjoy <laughs> creating characters and then like imagining kind of their their whole cloth lives i think so i i don't you know i'm writing so i'm writing a, another a new book now and i have i've written maybe it feels <laughs> like 17 pages of backstory this one chapter and i know it has to go i know that i know it's got to be cut down or, or reformatted or, or reshaped somehow but for me that's you know some writers will go you know will write lengthy descriptions that they know they have to cut or they'll have conversations that go on for pages and pages with no breaks and they're like i have to go back i think for me this is this is that for me this is my particular uh achilles heel i love backstory and i'm i know it has to be cut but it 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 does inform the character you know and it, it puts that person definitively in my mind and on the page yeah i was going to ask if there's like kind of an upside to it i mean obviously you know the downside is that you know it pushes against economy when it comes to a, a thriller and, and yeah. pacing but i have to imagine the process of like sussing out who this person is 
allows you to kind of keep the essence of that when you're trying to economize. Yeah, and and I do a couple of things to help with that. I I, I like to tape in my office uh, where I write. I I tape um, the outline of the book around me, and I also have my my own character bibles, you know, and I tape those on the wall around me too, which is nice because it feels like when I step into my when I sit at my desk, I'm sitting in the novel, you know, that I'm, I'm it grounds me, but I also have pictures of all the characters, you know, actors that I think they look like, friends who don't know I'm using their photo for this, you know, something else. And those um, those are all um, elements that, you know, that, that help inform me about the characters and where they are in their journey, it, especially for some reason, the photos. I'm not sure why, but something about the pictures um, gives me more insight in the characters than, than anything else. Do you also have maps? Uh, sometimes, but not recently. I used to. I, I used to use maps. Um, but at this point, no. I I like to. I, I read once somebody who said, um, a, a historical writer who said they write the story first and then add in the research later, which I thought was jarring and incorrect. But it stuck with me because I think something about it's true that I couldn't. I haven't been able to quite figure out. And for me, I like to write the locations first based off what I know and then figure out everything else, you know, later, where the distance is, where this town could be set that would make sense, you know, um, elements like that. I was going to ask is like the DMV is kind of a, I, I mean, it's not a character in the book, but it's certainly like, you know, there are characteristics, you know, like where, where Wharfside, let's say, where they end up at one point, you write about kind yeah. of these like communities that really only serve as people during, you know, peak season and then are ghost towns. And how much of that is, you know, knowledge of the area or research f for the book or like what, what kind of goes into populating and, and thinking about where they would end up in the, in the action. That's knowledge about the area because I've just lived here so long that I kind of know what I'm, you know, the, the areas I'm discussing. When I first lived here, when I first moved here, I would go to Baltimore all the time. And I fell in love with that city. And then my first writing, attempts at writing, were all based in Baltimore. And I would go to the city every weekend. And walking through the city and, and writing about places where I'd stepped um, gave it a, a very vivid, visceral sense of reality. I don't have that with the the books anymore. I don't need to go to those places. I, I don't do the Google map thing. But if there's, you know, like, a place that I want to describe, like a certain parking lot or something, I don't need to visit it, I feel, at this point. But that, what I did back in the day, that was a great, like, training exercise. You, you'd you mentioned before, but, you know, like, reading uh, other authors talking about their work, right? Like, the, you know, the the write the action first and, and then, like, figure out the yeah. logistics after. Do you do a lot of that, like, like, sussing out what other people do mechanically or, or creatively for, for your own work or is that just a curiosity kind of afterwards like it's not like you're trying to figure out how others do it so you yourself can do it you know sometimes but not often really you know part of me is afraid of like i just read last year i think saves the cat and Everybody had told me for years to read it. And I was like, no, I have a process. And what if it tells me I'm doing it all wrong? And I was really nervous about that. But I read it and I was like, okay, there's some stuff I'm going to steal from this and, and put in my process. And that's more of how it is now. You know, I'm four novels in and a uh, you know, ton of short stories and essays. And I feel like, you know, my process is, it, it feels loose to me, you know, because I you sort of recreate it for every book, but it tends to follow the same format. So I'll pick up tips. I'll talk to writers and see what they do. And I'll go to conferences and go to panels and I'll learn something new every time. But it's something I'm going to steal and use, not something that's going to fundamentally change how I write. Right. Like you were talking about, you know, writing to a picture. I don't know that necessarily every uh, author, you know, has a visual image of, of their character necessarily in mind that, you know, helps them. Um, in, in terms of doing that, though, like, is that to kind of help you find, like, voice? Like, to think of, like, you know, this this face would have this voice? Um, A little bit, but really it, it helps to 
uh, to sort of cement elements of that of that person. You know, I get in their expression. Like I, I have a picture of somebody who's looking, you know, very determinedly in the camera, but I can look at that picture and think like, okay, I see vulnerability there and I see strength and I see, and those are all inform it. It's kind of like I, I do a lot of searching for those pictures. And then when I find the right one, it's like finding a piece of art you like, you know, and these are actors photos and stuff, but still it, it, it's something about it resonates it, you know, in a more romantic sense, it'd be like, you know, finding someone beautiful you want to paint or something like that. But, you know, you have to, something about this person you want to capture. And that's what, that's really what that is for me. Uh, some writers, you know, Jordan Harper, who I love and admire a great deal, uh, has, um, uses a, a, I think he, I don't think he uses a vision board, but he does use music to inform his story and he, and the same song. So that from start to end, the story has a very defined theme. I think that's terrific. I I, I admire that a lot. I, I don't do that, but I can see how it uh, helps his work. How many of the characters have photos? Like how many, how many, um, like, is it only central characters that you have kind of an image that you're working off of? For the most part, yeah. I mean, if somebody is recurring, like I think for when she left, I had maybe... 12 10 to 12 photos on the wall so some anybody who i think has you know a significant speaking role like i had a you know it opens with the diner scene and in the diner scene i probably only have photos of two of the characters and there's maybe seven or eight in there um and i felt like i didn't need you know to to really embody those characters because they were only going to be in one or two scenes um, if it's somebody that I have to return to and write continually through the book, then I want to have a, a, a good sense of who that person is so I can return to that at different points. Now, the, the, the book is told from multiple characters' perspectives. Was that there from the beginning, like that you needed to tell the story in, in multiple voices? Or is that something when it kind of came to like figuring out plot mechanics, the best way to do it was through that? Yeah, you know, it, <laughs> it's funny you ask that because I, I I always feel like cheating um, when I do that. You know, it, it part of it is because I don't know if I could if I want to write a whole book in one person's point of view. And then the other thing is one of my so my second book had four points of view. Uh, they're gone. And the reviewers, the trade reviewers, I got all praised the uh, plotting of the book. And I was like. I don't think I plot well at all. I, you know, I, I feel like my plot, because I outline everything. So I'm like, my plots are, I feel not, not, you know, anything extraordinary. And writing in mysteries where the plot is is a question mark to the reader, they have to be really clever. I don't do mysteries, so I don't have to worry about that. But I'm, in, I'm neighbor to them. I read a lot and I admire what they do. But for me, with you write, if you write these multiple perspectives, you're telling like three to four different stories and it looks intricately plotted. <laughs> it looks like you weave this whole thing together. But in reality, you're just telling four different stories and then like, okay, this has to happen here, this has to happen here. And then these other connections will appear sort of, you know, organically as a result of that. So in like kind of editing them together, it seems more of a puzzle box than you necessarily conceived of it initially? Yeah, yeah. And I might be, you know, I might be downplaying that a bit because a lot I do a lot of work with the with the plotting of the book and the structure of it. But it's um, you know, it it's not uh some of the some of the stuff that 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 happens, you know, ends up happening unintentionally. And which is great. And that that's part of writing, right? You come across uh, a character, you, you know, you're like, if this happened, that'd be great. It changes everything. So a lot of it is is unintentional. To some extent, maybe it's floating in your mind somewhere. Because, you know, you'd mentioned before, Jordan. You know, writing to a piece of music and conceptually kind of conceiving of things in in context with that, and that that's not necessarily something you do. But the the parts of this book all open with quotations from the Bible. Was yeah. that like the framing of that? Because especially because each quote from the Bible alludes to what's going to happen in that part right whether it's you know mm -hmm. fleeing in genesis or something that like did you have those biblical quotes ahead of time or did you kind of figure out hey maybe this should be something that frames things and and search out the, you know like keyword search the bible for like you know 
flight or other, other kind of aspects? Uh, sometimes, you know, what I, what I would find is that I had a certain quote in mind or a verse that I'd read a while ago or something like that. And then it didn't quite work. So then I would be like, okay, well, let me find, let me, you know, find other good revenge quotes and then, you know, sort of look that way. Um, I think of the was it three quotes, uh, there were maybe two that were, uh, you know, or that, that were from the, you know, loose memory. And then one that I, uh, that I was like, I got, I got to find a good quote for this. Um, but the Bible illusions were important because they sort of play throughout the story, particularly in the character of Jake's mother. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, choosing like, I, I have to imagine because of, you know, her journey with addiction that the, you know, fi- finding some solace in, in the church then helps you, you know, weave in those those quotes. That's her backstory. Choosing that, w- was that like there from the get-go or did you kind of come across that as like, this is what she would end up doing based on, you know, what she did in the past? She's the hardest character I've ever written. And I'm not, I'm, you know, just between us and I guess everyone listen. <laughs> I'm not really satisfied with Ruby, the, that character. Um, I, I like what she represents. I like what she does. I think she's important, but I rewrote her over and over and over trying to figure out, you know, what makes her tick. And she has the most backstory of any character. And I felt that was necessary to explain her. Um, typically, I, I don't like to do that, but I... I really needed Ruby to be fleshed out and given her importance throughout the story. I wanted, I I thought it was, I ended up thinking a lot of that was necessary uh, because it also informs her son, Jake, which informs his relationship with Melissa. So, and, and she factors in so greatly throughout the story that it seemed um, really, really paramount to keep, to keep her, uh, her story uh, vivid. So, so then in figuring that, that out, like, like, do you read back and think, oh, I don't necessarily know if I've explained her motivation or how she landed here. And then that's, you know, why you incorporate more backstory. Is that kind of the process? A little bit. It, it's more that, um, yeah, sometimes, but you, you get a sense, you know what I mean? You start to, after a while, it's almost like a, a piece of music where, and I know that sounds pretentious, but it makes sense. Uh, a piece of music where notes fall. And you're like, that's not right. You know, you've written this and it's something. And then once you fix that note, it feels like everything else in the story falls in place. It, it's amazing, right? It's like a like a, a puzzle where one piece is out and you put it in, you're like, oh, I see the picture now. And it can be that one piece. Um, so... Yeah, with Ruby, it was really, it was a lot of polishing and then a lot of reinvention of who this woman was and uh, what created her. So you you mentioned that, you know, Ruby informs Jake and, and, you know, why he is what he is. The decision to make Jake into photography, did you wrestle with any other art forms or was this kind of the apparent one? Because I'm always curious when a a writer or puts someone doing something artistic in their work because I feel mm-hmm. like there's maybe like a, a one step kind of removed uh, examination of your own craft. Yeah. Uh, Cause at one point, you know, Jake talks about, you know, so he says uh, the sense of failure was creeping behind him. It's the, sh- the flip side of artistic ambition. And, and yeah. that to me seems like an authorial statement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, because you're, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, there's a point, right, where I remember, so I started writing seriously in 97, and I didn't get published till the mid 2000, 2010s, so it was a long time, and there's a point where you're like, am I being persistent or pathetic, you know, I mean, am I one of those singers in like a TV show that everyone's laughing at because they sound so terrible and they don't realize it, you know, and and to me, yeah, Jake, I wanted Jake to to sort of embody that. And then when it comes to including art, you're right. One of my one of my favorite books, you know, I've only read it once, so maybe it wouldn't hold up. But I read it in college after college was uh, Somerset Maugham's uh, *Of Human Bondage*, and he takes his main character through three major life um, stages where he does different things, kind of um, uh, kind of like Siddhartha. 
And one of those is the art stage. And I thought it was fascinating how he did that. And yeah, it, it is a bit reflective, but with photography, it wasn't, I, I've always found photography fascinating. I, I'm not good at it. I don't really like doing it, but I love looking at photos. Um, so the book preceding this one, centered around a dead jazz musician and that gave me a chance to explore music and and you know really celebrate a type of music that's meant so much to me and photography was a chance to learn about photography more in, in creating jake so so less a celebration of something you already knew than an exploration of like a different art form that allowed you to kind of touch on artistic exactly. expression there is something yeah, ex sorry go ahead Oh, no, no, please. I, I was going to say, there's something to the photography, too, that, like, you know, he stands at a remove from things, right? Like, even when he's in the moment, he's not quite there, right? Like, he's processing it yeah. through his camera rather than, like, through his head. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's dude, I don't know if you ever saw the Mitchells versus the Machines, but that uh, animated movie that came yes, out a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah, right? So the... Uh, the girl in it, the main character, she, you know, is always looking at something through her camera and her dad says, you know, you're not looking at the world really. And she's like, no, this is my real view of the world. And I, that, that stuck out to me, you know, and, and I felt like for Jake, there has to be that immersion. And, you know, with me, when I started writing and I took it seriously, which for me meant writing on every day, which, which is what it means to me for other people. It, it's something else. Um, I was very selfish. You know, and and I didn't have the commitments I have now to family or work, but it was, um, you know, I had the luxury to be selfish. And I think that's, I don't know if that's necessary, but it was something with Jake, you know, especially at the beginning when he's taking photos after a, a relatively, you know, uh, dangerous scene, I felt that was, you know, selfish, but powerful. It also... I guess maybe gives you a chance to hit pause on the action in some sense, like in the same way that he's kind of psychologically like hitting pause on processing something. You, you as the writer get a chance to like step back and examine the crime scene in some ways. Yeah, exactly. And it also gives you the chance to play a little bit, right? Because with Jake, he's constantly using analogies and metaphors in his in i mean it's third person but in his perspective he when he looks at something he sees it as something else um and to me that was really you know a, a fun thing to do because it gave me a chance to play with the um the rhythm of the story a little bit you know i i generally think i keep the same rhythm throughout my sentences but jake gives me the chance gave me the chance to to use a lot, a lot more analogy one person we haven't touched on that I, I do want to talk about is Lucky, the the hitman. Um, yeah, you know, was it always there from the start to to per show some of the story from from his perspective, from from a you know perpetrator rather than a a victim? Yeah, you know, I've always written about antiheroes, and the, those have been the majority of my characters. With this book, I wanted something different you know i wanted two characters and jake and melissa who have an honest love and that love has got to be real because it's got to be enough to convincingly lead melissa to this decision to to go down this dangerous path with lucky i loved the idea of this reluctant hitman but there is a danger that there was a trope and a comic trope and lucky could come off as a joke more than a character a character you know he'd be a caricature but so giving him love, giving him a sense of devotion to his family um, and having it represented in a couple of ways was a good way to to ground him and, you know, to and, and make him make him real and vulnerable. And that, I, I think, helped alleviate some of the, the caricature qualities of who he was. Now, the decision to make his, you know, cover life uh, as a realtor, I mean, because you, you talk about sort of you allude to the housing crisis you talk about you know like the the criminal enterprise is is you know based on a holding company that has real estate like it allows you to maybe talk a little bit about some social issues i think yeah and you know i mean the truth is you know with interest rates the way they are real estate agents need uh, a second gig and if you're not opening an etsy store you know most commonly you're becoming a contract killer 
<laughs> this is the, no, the natural fork in the road, huh? <laughs> yeah, it gave me a little bit of that opportunity, you know, and especially um, in this area, you know, it, 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 there was a little bit of that, you know, um, commenting on the housing and some of the neighborhoods. But beyond that, it was really more for me with Lucky like kind of a metaphor for who he was. You know, there's something about real estate he loves. He hasn't quite identified it, but he talks at one point about showing these open these empty houses to potential families and to me that that's that's kind of a lovely thing but also a sad thing because i think that's how lucky sort of sees his life i think he i think he sees his life in a way he fears the opposite you know the house full of family that's going to be empty it could also be argued i just thought that, of that i, I was going to say <laughs> I, the thing i just thought of is it could be also be argued he's kind of an empty house Exactly. Yeah. No, you're right. Wow, this is good. Why didn't I talk to you before this? Before I wrote the book, I really would have worked on that. That did. You're good. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. No. I, I mean, it's. I'm always curious because you know, like the author has kind of an in intention behind kind of why they they make things the way they are. But I think you know, there is some liberty to for the reader to kind of like infer things. Um, Absolutely. And 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 bring kind of their own like baggage to to when they open open the book, and that that kind of like leads me back to that beginning of like you know how you know to kind of like start where you start, and like how much you then are are infilling of like the character's baggage. Yeah, I mean it's it's weird. You don't you don't really you know in Lori Moore's short story How to Be a Writer, there's a part where. She's talking about, you know, the story's all like, I think it was a second person subjective or something, but it's all saying, you know, like, I, uh, like, then you go to this, then you do that, then you realize that writers are helpless uh, beings who have no idea what they've written or created. And I think there's some truth to that. You know, I, I don't like to look at my characters and use it to psychoanalyze myself, but I think you could. You know, I think I know with Lucky that his fears and his, you know, loves were very much my own. You know, I, I took that was directly. And then, you know, I mean, I'm I'm a big Christmas enthusiast. And I, 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 I put together our entire Christmas village with no help from my wife. Like that's, yeah, that's stuff that, that I could I could draw to. But all these characters to me contain like my vulnerabilities more than I think a lot of books I've written have. Yeah, I didn't know about those Christmas Village things, the the little pieces, and I, I looked it up because I was like, is is this a real thing, or have you like invented this? <laughs> and then discovered like there's like a whole community of people who are super into this stuff. Yeah, yeah, sickos. They really uh, get into it. But for Lucky, it gives him a chance, you know, to have this, you know, this idyllic place. But also, he doesn't know this, but it's something he controls. Mm. You know, it's it's a it's perfectly controlled and matched. And Lucky is to me a character who. And this is, again, for me, you know, really needs uh, order and control in his life. Well, and it's a perfect uh, hobby for a writer since it's all about world building, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, the book, When She Left, is out through Thomas and Mercer, E.A. Amar. Thanks very much for taking some time and congratulations on the release of the book. Oh, it was wonderful talking with you. Thank you for the writing tips. I'm being completely serious. That was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, best of luck to you in the future. Thanks very much. Yeah, I appreciate your time today. Um, so this will actually air tomorrow. Uh, just a heads up. Oh, great. I, I, um, because of a timing of another thing and uh, a book launch event, I've, I've pushed what was scheduled for tomorrow till next week. So um, yeah, this will air tomorrow and I'll, it'll be up as a download and uh, stream as well as the the fm broadcast so uh, i'll tag you on socials when i post it oh that's awesome thank you so much yeah, yeah. i'll make sure to, to get the word out